I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Saying that Tehran is not living up to the spirit of the nuclear deal, President Trump refused to recertify the 2015 accord. Trump laid out the administration's new strategy for Iran, which adopts a more aggressive stance toward the agreement and the country's missile program. He also imposed additional punitive measures on Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Trump also pledges his administration's full support for religious organizations. The first sitting president to address the Values Voter Summit promised a return to traditional American values. He also vowed to bring the phrase Merry Christmas back into national discourse. Former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Samantha Power, met today with the House Intelligence Committee. Power reportedly discussed Obama administration officials' attempts to unmask the names of Trump campaign advisors, inadvertently picking up on top-secret foreign communications. Air quality in San Francisco sank to the levels of smog-choked Beijing this week as soot from more than a dozen wildfires in California's wine country blanketed the Bay Area. The concentration of dangerous particulate matter was forecast to be just a few points shy of Beijing's. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. I'm Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the feud between Qualcomm and Apple goes to the next level with the chipmaker trying to ban sales of the iPhone in China. We'll break down who has the upper hand in this legal fight. Plus, Uber draws the line, launching an appeal against last month's London ban. We'll discuss the road ahead for the world's most valuable startup in one of its biggest markets. And the NBA season tips off Tuesday with the world champion Golden State Warriors ready to defend their title. My exclusive conversation with team president and COO Rick Welts on everything from the league's New Jersey, New Jersey deals to players protesting during the national anthem. But first to our lead. Qualcomm has fired another legal shot across Apple's bow, this time in China. Bloomberg has learned that the San Diego-based company has filed lawsuits in Beijing, seeking to ban the sale and manufacture of iPhones in China. This is just the latest salvo in a months-long battle between the two firms that began when Apple filed an antitrust suit against Qualcomm back in January. While Qualcomm gets most of its revenue from wireless chips, the majority of its profits come from patents that cover much of the technology inside smartphones. Phones. All of this coming as Apple tries to fend off local competitors in the Chinese smartphone market. Last year, 23% of Apple's $216 billion in sales came from China, obviously a hugely critical market for them. Joining me now here in the studio, Ian King, who broke this scoop for Bloomberg, and Matt Larson, a litigation analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. Ian, I will start with you. What exactly does this mean? Obviously, Qualcomm are going after Apple, trying to ratchet this up. The immediate conclusion is obviously there's no negotiations that are going to pr produce anything fruitful going on right now. So clearly Qualcomm feels like it has to take the threats, put the pressure up to that next level, and this is, this is as big as it gets. Now, Matt, China isn't normally seen as a forum that's friendly to patent holders. Why sue Apple in China? Yeah, over the last couple of years, the specialized IP courts in China have turned out to be a pretty good place to sue. Uh, they typically are favorable to patent owners. They've awarded U.S. companies a victory in nearly all of the lawsuits filed. Um, in addition, Qualcomm previously had some uh, some disputes with China over appropriate licensing rates for some of their standard essential patents on 3G, 4G, LTE. Uh, so they have a little bit of the good grace of the Chinese government having been approved for those licensing rates. Uh, they obviously are working with other phone manufacturers in China, so they have some goodwill going into this litigation. So Ian, does that mean Qualcomm has the upper hand here? Well, there's two sides as ever. I mean, Apple, of course, is, is an American company earning a lot of money in China, but at the same time, it's a massive indirect employer of China. Chinese people. If you're the Chinese government, if you're Beijing, do you want to see Foxconn workers laid off? Do you want to see them sat there doing nothing? So I think both sides have a lot of cards to play here as they make their case to, to Beijing. Ian, is there any precedent here? I mean, have we seen uh, companies aside from Qualcomm take this approach? 
Uh, yeah, so we've, we actually saw... Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at we, Matt, we, we, we but said Ian, Matt. Not a problem. We actually saw Nokia uh, take a similar approach in its patent licensing battle uh, with Apple. Uh, a lot of these companies will file in multiple jurisdictions, a lot of international litigation in order to gain leverage in settlement talks. Uh, and we also saw Qualcomm test out the intellectual property courts in China in its lawsuit against Meizu, the Chinese handset manufacturer, uh, and was able to successfully enforce some of its patents against yeah. Meizu, and that eventually resulted in a licensing deal as well. So uh, there is some precedent in the smartphone uh, area and for both Apple and Qualcomm and litigating in China. Ian, what's been the response so far from Apple? Apple, of course, were completely dismissive, said this is just another you know, tactic, another legal maneuver, and it won't mean anything. They haven't even heard of these patents. They're all new, nothing we've ever negotiated, completely dismissive, as you would imagine. So, you know, what, what, is, what does this actually mean for Apple? I mean, the potential consequences here are huge. And, and that's where I think the interesting analysis that we got later on in the story came from was an, Alice, an analyst said, look, if this even gets close to going in the way that Qualcomm wants it, Apple will start writing checks. There's mm -hmm. no way they will allow themselves to be cut off from production. They'll pay Qualcomm up front and then negotiate later. On that note, Matt. What do we see next? I mean, what's the next step here? So the next step, the Chinese courts are, are pretty fast, but it still takes at the at the fastest maybe six months until trial, uh, about a year or so until uh, cases conclude. Around that timeline, we're getting into the third quarter of next year when Qualcomm's International Trade Commission suit in the U.S. will come to a close. Some of the U.S. litigation will have gone to trial, and we'll start seeing some trial results. So unless there are new, new suits filed, it's a little bit of uh, a quiet period on the litigation front until the third quarter of next year. Meantime, Ian, Qualcomm just got fined In hugely Taiwan. by, right, so tell us about that. Yeah, again, another record fine. They managed to get a record fine in Korea. They've got a record fine. They're setting records everywhere. The European Union is still looking at them. Obviously, we've got the U.S. regulators having a look at them. This really doesn't look good for them. The, the overall momentum is, is obviously very poor. They need some kind of a victory. It's been argued by some that nobody really though has an interest in taking this all the way to trial. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants concrete precedent set because you never know when you're going to have to sue somebody else. So the argument is this is all a maneuver for who can get the best position going into final negotiations for a settlement mm -hmm. and then everything goes away. All right. Well, I know you'll keep us posted. Ed King of Bloomberg Tech, Matt Larson of BI, thank you both so much for joining us. All right, well, Twitter may have deleted data crucial to Congress's probe of Russian involvement in last year's U.S. presidential election. According to a report in Politico, the social media company may have erased tweets and other user data that could be very valuable to investigators. Cybersecurity analysts say that information may be lost for good. Twitter, Facebook, and Alphabet have been invited to testify publicly in front of Congress on November 1st about possible Russian meddling. Coming up. Uber still facing trouble in London. How the ride-hailing company is pushing back on a ban on its service next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. There's a vacancy at the top of Samsung's C-suite. CEO Kwano Yoon is stepping down. He's been with Samsung for decades, but says it needs new leadership after the bribery scandal that led to its de facto chief going to prison. The news comes as Samsung announced record operating profit on booming demand for displays and memory chips. The world's largest startup is making a stand in the UK. Uber has appealed a decision by authorities in London to not renew its operating license. Transport for London said last month it had concerns about the ride-hailing services safety and attempts to skirt regulation. The appeal allows the company's drivers to continue operating in London while the talks are continuing with TFL. The first hearing in the case isn't likely to take place until mid-December and further appeals could extend the process for months or even years. Joining us now to discuss Bloomberg Tech's Eric Newcomer, who covers all things Uber, of course. So, meantime, Uber is still operating right. in London right, right now, but they have officially filed this appeal. What does this mean? It, it means that we keep going. I think from the beginning, the fact that Uber was allowed to continue to operate even, even as they lost their license was a sign that they're probably going to get to stay on the road. I mean, it's just also the prime minister has right, defended out of them. Of Uber. And Uber's, 
I think Uber has sort of changed the tone. Dara Khosr Shahi, the new CEO, really apologized, said they'd made mistakes, and I think that sort of appeased London somewhat. And we'll have to sort of watch that pro that process play out of time, over time, and I'm sure London will try to extract maybe more data transparency or other ways to supervise Uber. But I think it's, you know, this process continues for a little while. So, I mean, you, you've maintained this whole time that you don't think it's likely that Uber is going to be banned in London at the right. end of all this, that yeah. they're, they're likely to recover, ultimately. If, if their point here was that Uber was unsafe for the road, why let the company continue to operate while they appealed the license? Um, it seems very political. Um, but I think it'll get resolved eventually. What sort of reports are you getting from within the company about how the new CEO is working out? Are people happy? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think he's helping to turn around their reputation. I think the reaction to the London incident was that reputation really matters. And I think that's uh, sort of front and center for him. He said to employees, you know, it's going to be a hard six months. We have, they have a lot of legal trouble ahead of them, as we just reported. There are five different criminal probes into Uber right now. So I think he knows it's going to be hard, but he's trying to play clean up, bring people together, and get the company moving forward. Now, we reported uh, last week on the big SoftBank deal that that was near closing, which meant that if it closed, all former employees would be able to sell shares in this deal, right? Right. So the board approved it. They mm -hmm. approved sort of the suite of governance changes in the SoftBank deal you know, a billion dollars for Uber and nine billion shares changing hand from existing investors to new investors. What's happened now is that uh, the venture firm Benchmark seems to have, hit, they have this right of first refusal, which would essentially allow them to buy into the deal if the price was low enough. So hmm. instead of just SoftBank and Dragoneer and General Atlantic buying shares, maybe Benchmark could if it's cheap enough. So there's, what's really happening seems to be a price negotiation that stalled the deal a little bit. And so that's being worked out. And yeah, it's a trapeze act, <laughs> I, I, high stakes, it's, it's a lot. Of hangs. Uncertainty for these former employees, right? Who right. want to sell their shares for anyone who wants yeah. to cash out right. for whatever reason, right? Exactly. And the governance reforms are contingent on the deal going through. So in every way, uh, this needs to go forward. Yeah. And explain the, the status of those governance reforms. This, this concerns They've passed the, board the board composition and right. Travis's oh, okay, role yeah. in the company, right? Well, they went from 11 board members to 17 with plans to mm -hmm. fill those with independent board members. They changed to sort of one share, one vote, diminishing Travis Kalanick's voting power in terms of shareholder votes. They said that if a former, a former officer of the company is to become CEO, the board would have to approve them by two thirds. Basically, a lot of them were meant to make it harder for Travis Kalanick to sort of push his way back into the company or to have sort of too much of a role going forward while moving to a more democratic voting structure. But all of this is contingent on the deal yes. being closed, yeah. right? Yeah, was, it was sort of a dual, we'll approve the deal and the governance and that all needs to come together. And Benchmark dropping its lawsuit against Travis also hangs on all this. So it's, I mean, I think people want to see it through, but they also want to, you know, there are billions of dollars at stake. I mean, SoftBank and Dragoneer are looking to buy up upward like $9 billion worth of shares from existing investors. That's a lot of money. And so whether the price is 40, 45, 50, 55, like that's a lot of money in play. It makes a difference. All right, Eric Newcomer, I know you'll keep us posted, our Bloomberg yep. Tech reporter who covers Uber. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now Jamie Dimon may consider Bitcoin a fraud, but the cryptocurrency just had a massive week, surging from $4,300 on Monday to $5,600 by the end of the week. Meantime, the debate over the Bitcoin phenomenon rages on. Bloomberg Surveillance spoke with RBS Chairman Howard Davies and JP Morgan International Chair Jacob Frankel to get their thoughts. Take a listen. It's a phenomenon. Uh, if you want to, we can discuss the specifics of the Bitcoin, its, uh, it's uh, um, challenges, the fact that it is, it is not scalable, the fact that it is uh, very anonymous, and there are mechanisms and ways to improve the, the functioning. But I think that many people who are yeah. uh, talking about Bitcoin talk from ignorance and talk from a way of how to how can I protect my own turf from what I perceive to be a competition. Yeah. But think about Bitcoin as a generic name. There are a lot of new encrypted currencies that are blockchain right. based yeah. that can be doing something yeah. useful. Francine, I got an email here from Jamie in New York. It says, don't let Jacob answer that. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's ask Sir Howard then. <laughs>
<laughs> Sir Howard, what's your take on Bitcoin? Well, uh, I'm, I'm a bit cautious here because Jacob has uh, warned anyone who doesn't really know about it from so talking about it. And, uh, you know, I cannot claim to be an expert. I think I would see two things. I can see that a cryptocurrency like oh. Bitcoin, and Jacob's right to say there are others, being useful in a blockchain context and speeding up sort of interbank transactions, uh, I can see a, f a, a utility in the financial system of that. Whether Bitcoin and things like it can become a reliable store of value for investment purposes and replace other currencies, that I'm much more doubtful about uh, because it, they're extremely volatile and very uncertain. So I'm not quite sure I see it arriving as a store of value. Sir Howard Davis, yeah, one of the reasons for the volatility <clears throat> is that there is no mechanism that affects the supply of it. But Correct. if you design a system in which well, the supply itself responds to the degree of volatility, then it is another okay. progress. In other words, there is a project. That was RBS Chair Howard Davies and JP Morgan International Chair Jacob Frankel speaking on Bloomberg Surveillance. Coming up, Hollywood's sexual harassment saga continues. This time, it is Amazon taking action against one of its top executives. That story is next. This is Bloomberg. Amazon is said to be making a push into sportswear. According to a Bloomberg exclusive, the company is enlisting some of the biggest athletic apparel suppliers as part of a move into private label sportswear. Amazon has previously ventured into private label fashion, offering office clothing, jackets and dresses under names like Good Threads and Paris Sunday. However, pushing into active wear would bring fresh competition to some of the world's biggest athletic brands like Nike, Lululemon and Under Armour. Meantime, out of Amazon Studios, the head of its film and TV unit has been suspended due to allegations of sexual harassment. Roy Price is accused of making inappropriate advances to a female producer, this according to The Hollywood Reporter. Issa Hackett, a producer on one of Amazon's most popular shows, The Man in the High Castle, said Price sexually harassed her at an event two years ago. The allegations come days after similar allegations led to the firing of movie producer Harvey Weinstein. Amazon has two TV projects in development with the Weinstein Company, which, according to the Wall Street Journal, is now looking for a new owner. Uh, Bloomberg's entertainment reporter, Lucas Shaw, joining us now from L.A. to wrap all of these headlines. And Lucas, of course, uh, another actress, Rose McGowan, also playing into this story. Uh, what do we know, first of all, about what Amazon knew about Roy Price and when? We know that rumors about improper behavior by Roy Price had been swirling for a long time. Uh, I and several other people had heard that there were stories in the works that Amazon seemed to have managed to keep at bay. And then in, I want to say, August or so, the information, the, the tech news site published a story by Kim Masters, who traditionally writes for The Hollywood Reporter, about Roy Price. Uh, it turns out that you know, The Hollywood Reporter and several other outlets had decided that they were not able to publish it. Part of the problem being that there weren't any women on the record accusing Roy Price of improper behavior. And then what happened was after the, the Harvey Weinstein scandal, after all the allegations against him, Issa Hackett then felt emboldened and went on the record with Kim Masters in The Hollywood Reporter. Amazon had to know something, uh, you'd assume, because Roy Price is a pretty senior executive there. There had been these, these allegations for some time. Uh, but, but how much people knew and when we're still figuring out. Amazon acted pretty swiftly this week. You have to imagine that given all the controversy sw surrounding Weinstein, that they didn't want that to, to rub off on them. They want to try and defang this as quickly as possible. Meantime, at the same time, Rose McGowan, the actress, said that she tweeted that she told Roy Price that she was sexually assaulted by Harvey Weinstein and asked the company not to work with him. Uh, in a tweet storm, she actually spoke out directly to Jeff Bezos saying, be the change you want to see in the world, stand with truth. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how Rose McGowan fits in here. Yeah, well, 
what you have seen in the case of Harvey Weinstein, in the case of a lot of these men who are accused of you know, years of, of sexual deviance, of predation, of harassment, is that you had a lot of isolated incidents that if you'd had someone able to stitch them together, would have made it clear that this person should no longer, you know, if all the allegations are true, that the person should lose their job, should not be, you know, should potentially be prosecuted. But all of the incidents were kind of one-off. You had Roy, Rose McGowan tell, Roy Price. You had some. You had a lot of stories come out this past week after the initial New York Times story detailing some of the allegations against Harvey Weinstein. After the New Yorker story, adding more women uh, who had said who said that that Harvey had done things wrong. You had Gwyneth Paltrow come out in a separate New York Times story detailing what had happened to her and Brad Pitt speaking to him. So there was this long track record of alleged abuse that it you know it just took too long to come out. Now fortunately, you had some women who were brave enough to to come forward and share, and you had some reporters who really kind of stuck with it and found the story. Uh, but in the case of, of Harvey Weinstein, this is something that clearly goes back at least two decades. You know, and yet you have others saying that this, this was an open secret, at least about H Harvey Weinstein in particular, and, and that it took now obviously decades uh, to come out. Where do you see the chips falling here, Lucas? What are people saying in Hollywood? I think you have a lot of male executives who are looking over their shoulder right now, wondering, because we know that, that Harvey Weinstein and Roy Price are not the only two, two Hollywood executives, not the only two executives throughout, throughout corporate America uh, who ha have done something wrong or been accused of doing something wrong. I have to imagine that more will come out in the coming days, coming weeks. This is not something that's going away. You know, we've, we've, it's been a, a, a constant trope and story in Silicon Valley this year as well. You just, you have a lot of these companies that are run by men who, uh, for w one reason or another, uh, believe that they are, uh, they are able or empowered to, to act improperly. Uh, you know, most people in the entertainment business think that, uh, that Roy Price is probably going to lose his job. We, we haven't heard anything from that, uh, to that effect from Amazon, though he is suspended indefinitely. Um, and in the case of, of both Harvey and, and Roy Price, to, to what you said, Harvey's behavior was something of a, a, a alleged behavior was something of an, you know, a, a widely known secret, but nobody knew the extent of it. I, I spoke with someone earlier today who's worked with the Weinstein Company for 20 or 30 years. Everybody knew that Harvey was kind of an abusive boss, at least verbally. They'd heard rumors of what he had done to women, but nobody had the, the concrete evidence. And so what you need is you know, more good reporting to, right. to prove what people have done. And women who are willing to come forward. That's what it took. Okay, Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw, thank you so much. Obviously, this is something we're gonna continue to follow. Coming up, an exclusive conversation with Golden State Warriors President and Chief Operating Officer Rick Welts. We will cover the team's latest trip to China and their new partnership with Rakuten and, of course, the upcoming NBA season. That is next. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. President Trump on Friday announced his administration's new strategy for Iran, which adopts a more aggressive stance toward the ongoing nuclear agreement with Tehran. The president also imposed additional punitive measures on the Iranian equivalent of the National Guard. I am authorizing the Treasury Department to further sanction the entire Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps for its support for terrorism and to apply sanctions to its officials, agents and affiliates. Iran's President Hassan Rouhani released a statement responding to President Trump's comments today about the 2015 nuclear deal. In an address to the Iranian people, Rouhani said that President Trump doesn't know the deal isn't unilateral and that one country can't dictate terms of the accord. Meantime, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu congratulated President Trump on his decision not to recertify the nuclear deal, an action Netanyahu called, quote, courageous. He boldly confronted Iran's terrorist regime. If the Iran deal is left unchanged, one thing is absolutely certain. In a few years' time, the world's foremost terrorist regime will have an arsenal of nuclear weapons, and that's a tremendous danger for our collective future. President Trump has just created an opportunity to fix this bad deal. 
Civilians continue to flee Raqqa as the U.S.-led coalition intensifies the offensive to reclaim the Syrian city from Islamic State. About 80 percent of the city is said to be back under government control, but government troops are still attempting to evacuate some 4,000 civilians from the area. Kenyan opposition leader Raila Odinga is questioning the West's commitment to the electoral process in Africa. He warns democracy is in jeopardy on the continent because activists are unsure of international support. Odinga announced he was dropping out of the October 26th rerun of his country's presidential election, but is willing to return if the Electoral Commission accepts demands for reforms. UNESCO's executive board has chosen France's Audrey Azoulay as the UN agency's new chief. The board rejected a candidate from Qatar who was considered the front runner. Azoulay takes control as the cultural organization struggles through financial problems and criticism over the inclusion of the Palestinians in 2011. The U.S. and Israel plan to withdraw from UNESCO over its perceived anti-Israel bias. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. In New York, I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. The countdown for the start of the NBA season is on. On October 17th, defending champs, the Golden State Warriors square off against the Houston Rockets. This season, the Warriors will be debuting a slightly updated look, sporting the name of the Tokyo-based internet company Rakuten with the company's logo in a small patch on their jerseys. This is part of a multi-year partnership that has Rakuten becoming the official e-commerce and video-on-demand partner of the Warriors. Joining us now for an exclusive interview, Golden State Warriors president and COO Rick Welts. Rick, thanks so much for joining us. Great, Great to be here. here in the studio. So why Rakuten and why put this logo on their jerseys? Well, as you probably know, this is the first year that uh, the NBA has allowed any corporate representation on the jerseys. It was not an uncontroversial step. Uh, and I think every team has tried to be very careful about selecting the partner. We had actually a tremendous amount of interest from companies based outside the United States, which I think is a bit of a reflection on kind of where the Warriors are as a brand right now in the world. Uh, Rakuten was not the most lucrative offer that, that we had, but we felt uh, in getting to know the company that was most closely aligned with, with how we operate our business and who we wanted to be in business with. So official e-commerce partner, VOD partner, affiliate marketing partner, how does this expand across all those realms? Well, I think North America is a real opportunity for Rakuten. Uh, if you're in other parts of the world, if, if you're in Asia or Europe, you know much more about Rakuten than American, company, American consumers know. And I think that's, that's part of the strategy, to attach to a, a brand like the Warriors that has not only a global footprint, but obviously a very big footprint in the United States, and, and use that popularity of the Warriors to, uh, to get Americans more familiar with the kind of things that Rakuten does. Do you, how much of a trend you see this becoming? I mean, is, is the NBA going to be taking a page out of NASCAR with, you know, the ads on the jerseys? <laughs> I, I get the feeling you don't think that's a great way to go. Uh, I think it's really interesting to watch uh, sports around the world and see how sports uh, and the economic side of sports grows. Uh, the idea that you wouldn't have a corporate sponsor across the, the chest of a jersey uh, in Europe or other places in the world would be a head scratcher. Like, why wouldn't you do that? Americans, uh, I think, have a much more careful approach to that. And I think we just have to see what the reaction is. I do think it's inevitable there'll be more of this across all the leagues as time goes on. Speaking of your international business, uh, Steph Curry has now surpassed Kobe Bryant for jer jersey sales in China. You guys just came back from Shanghai. Talk to us about the reception of the Warriors in China and the popularity of a guy like Steph. I, you know, it's really hard to put into words until you've experienced it. We went four years ago. Uh, we happened to go with the Lakers when they had Kobe Bryant, and I think we were the other team. We hadn't achieved the success that we have today. Uh, and I think it was a real wake-up call to our players and to our team of what the opportunities are for individual players and teams in China. Since, you know, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, uh, uh, Clay Thompson have all been taking yearly trips on their own time during the summer. And what we saw 
in combination with that, in combination of the popularity of the team right now and the success we've had, the only thing I can equate it to, I was lucky enough in 1992 to travel to Barcelona with the Dream Team, uh, and it was the same scene. It was hundreds of people outside the hotel 24 hours a day hoping for a glimpse of a player everywhere we went from airports to events. Uh, just hundreds or thousands of fans trying to get a glimpse of the stars. So how would you describe the state of and the potential of your international business? You know, I, I really think it's the NBA's advantage uh, compared to the other traditionally American sports going forward. I, I don't think most Americans really understand the scale of what the rest of the world calls football. We call soccer around the world. Uh, basketball is the number two sport in the world. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, a blueprint going forward that I think would make you very bullish on the international future of the league. Uh, we have a game that's played in every country in the world. 300 million Chinese play basketball. Uh, but we have a different model than soccer because every kid who grows up in Buenos Aires you know, wants to play for his club team or then the national team in the World Cup. Every kid growing up dribbling a basketball anywhere in the world wants to play in one league. They want to play in the NBA. You see that in the players that are on the court. We have 25 plus percent of our players from outside the United States now and the international distribution of our television creates an unbelievable opportunity for the NBA to grow internationally going forward. You guys are working on a new arena down the street. Yes. Uh, curious, we're in Silicon Valley's backyard. What sort of high tech features fans can expect? Well, it's not just an arena, number one. It's a 12-acre site that includes office buildings, uh, uh, 29 different retail, mostly restaurant places, a plaza, a five-and-a-half-acre park. Uh, it's going to be a new gathering place for the city of San Francisco and the entire Bay Area. Um, it's interesting. You, you bring up the technology. We want to have the very best technology available in, in a sports environment there, but we're not hanging our hat on that as, as why you should come because technology for technology's sake uh, to me is, is like a false promise. At some point it, there'll be something newer and better. Technology that, that enables the fan experience and improves the guest experience, then that's valuable. So all we talk about the guest experience, it's, it's empowered by the technology, but it's not, it's not the technology in and of itself that makes that. You're the second team ever to use a personal seat license, which means that the ticket holder has the right to buy the tickets year after year. Any concern that this might discourage fans or prevent, you know, real fans from seeing the game when a lot of companies and businesses are going to be buying these tickets? You know, we really, uh, first of all, we have a very different program than it's ever been introduced before. We actually have a way you get your money back for the investment you make at the end of 30 years. You get, you get all your money back. Uh, but we have to price it in a way that people can afford it. I mean, one of the one of the reasons the Warriors have been so successful is our audience, and we actually expect a great majority of our season ticket holders to follow us from Oakland to San Francisco. Uh, all of our season tickets will have a membership fee associated with them. Our game by game tickets will not. If you're just you know, and we're actually going to sell fewer season tickets. Uh, in the new Chase Center than we are currently selling at Oracle. So we have to be smart in the way we price. Uh, but I would remind you this is the first time in decades that uh, a project of this size has been entirely privately financed. There are no public funds going toward building this $1.8 billion project in San Francisco. So the realities of the finances, this is something we have to do. Uh, but I think we're doing it in a way that's as fan friendly as it can be. You've got some former tech industry owners as part of the team, current tech people, part of the team. How is the team itself using tech and innovation to up the game? Well, you know, I think uh, <clears throat> most of it applies to the game itself. Uh, the level of analytics that are being applied to the, playing the game of basketball right now has gr grown exponentially over the last few years. You know, we have technology in our practice facility that, that tracks the players. We have biometrics that we can use now. Um, I think, you know, we're learning how to implement all that on the court to try to improve team performance. Uh, and that's a work in progress and will always be a work in progress, I think. But in terms of our affinity toward at least having the data, uh, we want to have it. How we deploy it, how we use it, and whether we can really get a competitive advantage, I think that's what we're all trying to figure out right now. All right. Rick Welts, President and COO of the Golden State Warriors, you are sticking with me. We've got much more to discuss. We're going to be talking about the outlook for the Warriors' upcoming season and the national anthem protests spreading across sports leagues. This is Bloomberg.
Now, the national anthem protest coming out of the NFL has sparked a national debate amongst other sports leagues across the U.S. The issue of players' rights and proper ways of protesting coming to the forefront. Still with us to discuss, Golden State Warriors President and Chief Operating Officer Rick Welts in an exclusive interview. This all started when Steph Curry said he didn't want to go to the White House to celebrate the title. Donald Trump uh, felt insulted and he tweeted that while Steph and the Warriors were no longer welcome. This spread to the NFL with players kneeling during the national anthem. President Trump wasn't happy about that either. Uh, the NBA commissioner has now said to the players, look, you guys have to stand. Where do you weigh in on this? <laughs> well, you know, I don't think I'm in a position to comment on what other leagues or other teams are doing. You know, I can say I think I think the saddest part of this right now is I think the messages have become very muddled. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are putting their own spin and their own take. Uh, the players may be trying to express some things and other people are putting a different spin on it. So I think it's kind of sad. I think it, it, now we've kind of lost any kind of focus on it. As far as our team goes, you know, we, we didn't, weren't able to have a meeting to decide what we wanted to do in the White House. As you said, we were uninvited before, uh, before we had an opportunity to discuss as a team, and that's just the way we work. I mean, the Warriors organization, uh, everyone has a voice, and when we make decisions, we do it together. And I think that we're very proud of our players. These are, you know, you can talk about what these players are. These players are professional athletes, but you need to talk about who these players are, too. And these are, you know, we're blessed to have a roster full of some of the most most thoughtful, articulate athletes in sports today. And, you know, anyone who thinks all they think about or all they should be allowed to talk about is playing the game of basketball, I think, really misses the point. Sports and politics throughout history have always intersected and always will intersect, whether we like it or not. Uh, and I think that we're very proud of how our players have represented their own views in a, in a very thoughtful way. And, uh, you know, we would encourage them to continue to do that in the future. So, look, the season starts next week week you've got your first game what have you said to the team about what you expect for them if they want to make a statement during the national anthem is that okay well uh, the players haven't brought anything forth and that's the way again the Warriors work um, you know I think you're right the one difference between the NFL and the NBA is the NBA actually does have a rule uh, that says that the players should stand during the national anthem um, you know, I think the I think our players have a lot of ways to express themselves because they are such high-profile individuals. Uh, when they're off the court, I think they have ways to get their opinions out there, and you know, I, I think they'll just decide what they want to do. And I think the team would embrace whatever decision they make. You know, understanding that the NBA rule it does have a rule in place. Have you guys had any line of communication with the White House? I mean, where does things stand between the team and Steph and? the president as far as we're concerned we got the direction that morning right so uh, we'll be in Washington we haven't yet decided what the team's going to do we want to do something to celebrate our championship that's what this is supposed to be about when the team who won the championship goes to Washington the next year it's about celebrating your championship so we're gonna do something to celebrate our championship when we're in Washington it, it just won't be at the White House so next week first game can anyone beat the Warriors you know, the more I read, the, the more I have to believe it's just not possible. Unfortunately, I've been doing this my entire life, and uh, if you, you can go back any season and, and read the preseason predictions and find out how, how many mistakes people made at the beginning of the year. We're, we're healthy. We're thrilled that we have the core of our team together that, that has been to the finals. KD, still there. The last three years. <laughs> so, uh, listen, we're, we're incredibly optimistic, but right now we haven't won a game, so it would be a little premature to, to decide where we're going to be at the end of the season. All right, well, I can think of a few people who are rooting for you guys. Uh, Rick Welts, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, President and COO of the Warriors. We'll be watching next week. Great. Thanks thank for stopping you. by. Coming up, SoftBank's Vision Fund is the gift that keeps on giving, this time investing in Mapbox, a mapping and location platform for developers. We'll uncover all the details next. This is Bloomberg.
Facebook is making it easier to eat. A new feature allows users to order meals through third-party delivery services or directly from restaurants like Chipotle and Five Guys. The social network hopes users will stay on its site longer instead of logging off to place orders elsewhere. According to some analysts, it's also a way to gather valuable customer data and stay in contact with consumers. Earlier this week, Mapbox announced a $164 million Series C funding round led by the SoftBank Vision Fund. The Vision Fund raised almost $100 billion this year and is blanketing the venture capital market and tech sector with this money. Mapbox is a mapping and location platform for developers that competes with the likes of Google and here. Joining me now, Mapbox CEO Eric Gunderson. So your maps uh, power companies like Airbnb and Snapchat. You know, what, what do you offer that's different than, for example, Google? Yeah, so we let a developer go in and not only put a map inside their app, but totally customize it. So open up Snapchat, zoom out. You get to see a total Bitmoji world. Mm -hmm. Their designers made the map totally custom, and in the map, fused in the map, uh, you see heat maps of where people are going. So if you're going out tonight, you want to see like the scene in the bar area, just zoom in, you'll see the heat map, click in, and you get to see all the snaps. Because the map is flexible, anybody can go in and make something totally custom. On the other end of the spectrum, look at weather data. Totally different, but you need to be able to have that live weather data stream into the map, and then you get to control the entire, uh, entire experience. So $164 million, that is a lot of money. What do you intend to use that for? Yeah, um, number one, auto. Mm. Uh, my first trip. Uh, next week is right to Detroit. Mm. You're going to see us properly grow our presence uh, there. And when I say auto... With automakers in their navigation system? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I mean auto in two ways. One, uh, auto today is maps for people. Mm. I want to be able to take those same kind of custom design tools that Snap was able to use and give them to these people who have been des designing great cars. Mm. So if designers in Detroit can take control of the dashboard and own the relationship with drivers, that's going to be awesome. Mm. But also auto for tomorrow mm -hmm. and those are maps for robots being able to have really high definition maps that help the sensors on the car align that's uh, that's a huge investment so softbank obviously has a lot of money what kind of investor do you expect them to be are they going to be a vocal presence or what you know what, what sort of mandate do you have from them yeah uh, the reason we chose uh, softbank was because of their long-term vision mm. uh, you're reading a lot about this today uh, with masa and just like that longer term perspective I mean when you raise this much money you're making a long play. And with SoftBank, I wanted to have a bench around me of experienced people that could help build a long-term company. And from Rajiv to Deep to Vikas, like these are people that have been there, done that before in building huge global companies, and that's who we're bringing next to us. What are the risks associated with taking on that kind of cash? Uh, I mean, that's a lot of money. Oh yeah, right? pr proper. <laughs> so uh, anytime any time in terms of uh, capital, like you're, you don't want to be overcapitalized. Right. Uh, the reality for us, uh, one, we, we've been incredibly capital efficient to date. So we bootstrapped everything mm -hmm. profitably. We only raised outside capital twice. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to be really scrappy mm -hmm. with the resources we have and build a platform that now allows us to radically accelerate, not just into big long-term plays like auto, but uh, really immediate plays like AR and VR let alone glow the, take the presence global now. Let's talk about some of the trends in mapping. Obviously, there are wildfires raging up in, in Northern California, Napa and Sonoma County, not yeah. too far from here. The air quality is horrible. Um, you, you said earlier that fire, fires in mapping is now a new, a new trend. Yeah, look, the, just before I came, uh, came on air, I saw uh, some of the imagery coming out from Digital Globe, the largest satellite company in the world. And they've got these sensors that can actually see through smoke. And they're starting to open up that data for other developers to publish out on the web. Uh, so you can actually see, like, people don't know where their houses are relative to the fire. And uh, these maps are just starting to show up on, on Twitter. So how do you see the mapping world <laughs> shaping up you know, with a you know, behemoth like Google? Mm -hmm. Of course, Apple also, also is working on maps. And a smaller company like you. Yeah. Uh, well, we get to, uh, we're about to be a lot less small, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, look, there are only four sets of uh, global data in the world. You mentioned Google. You mentioned here, who's now owned by the German autos. Uh, TomTom mm -hmm. also. And then, uh, then there's us. I mean, we're able to collect over 200 million miles of data a day. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and we're able to do that because of all the, all the sensors, right? Anytime you're using Mapbox in an app, we're getting anonymous aggregated data back and constantly updating the map, putting new roads there, showing the actual speed of the roads. And that, that decentralized sensor network, that's, that we're mapping the world live with that kind of uh, with that kind of data. All right, we'll keep our eye on you guys. Eric Gunderson, CEO of Mapbox, thank you so much for hey. joining us. Great to have you here. Thank you. On the show. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. We will see you on Monday.